Thank you, choir. It's good to have you back after a summer break and uh, just a unique vantage point. Sitting up here, I can't see them, but I can see you and actually saw some of you uh, singing along. So just a reminder, 6.30 Wednesday night was the choir rehearsal. Our speaker for today is Dr. Jerry McFarland. He is currently Dean of Online Students at Westminster Seminary. Uh, was previously Dean of Resident Students uh, a few years back when a, a certain Irishman was a student there. So again, here's your opportunity to ask for stories and get the background. Um, but uh, we are delighted to have uh, Dr. McFarland with us and invite you up and pray God's blessing upon you. Thank you. Good morning. If you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Jonah, uh, that's on page 982 of your pew Bibles. We'll look at that in a moment. But allow me a couple of personal observations to bring to you, if I may. I just want to say to you, I'm a newcomer to this church. I've only been here twice, uh, but know a lot about it by a lot of colleagues and students who have been here. Uh, and I just want you to know, first impressions are important, right? You're a welcoming church. I felt very welcomed as I visited my wife and I two weeks ago. I felt very welcomed and enjoyed. Even though there were masks, I could see smiles. <laughs> and I just want to encourage you that uh, the grace, uh, the fragrance of the gospel is present. Thank you for welcoming strangers in your midst. It's a good place to come. Uh, another observation is, yes, I, uh, I am the current online dean of students. We have over 300 students around the world that I have the privilege of just being a pastoral voice to them to make sure you grow in the grace as well as the knowledge and to metaphorically say to those students, put your books down, <laughs> talk to me about Jesus. What are you learning about Christ and being in the school of Christ? That's been a great privilege for me, and over 20 years ago, I did that for almost 13 years on campus. And so it's been a blessing for me in this season of my life to come across people like Chris Kennedy. <laughs> I knew that boy when <laughs> he was figuring out life and marriage and watching what Jesus has done in his life. I knew another man by the name of Dr. John Curry. <laughs> when he was a young man on campus. What a privilege for me in this season of my life, kind of as a father in the faith, to watch my children growing in Christ and where they've, so I cannot wait to get my arms around Chris Kennedy again and to be, so I'm delighting with you, but praying as well. Well, with that in mind, it's a privilege for me to bring God's word to you, and I've chosen uh, a longer reading, which is coming from the first chapter of Jonah, so if you have your Bibles, please follow along. Uh, this is not so much a didactic thing, it's a narrative. It's a story that we're all familiar with. But what I want to address to you this morning, uh, it's important for us to get the whole context of this story. So as I read this, as one of my professors used to say, try to read feelingly as well. Try to put yourself in the place of this story, because that will be important for me to divulge to you what I want to share with you about the work of the gospel in our lives. So here now, verses 1 through 17, the entire chapter, follow along with me the word of God in the book of Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. And so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. 
Perhaps that God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew even more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon us. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as, you ple as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of, the, of that fish three days and three nights. This is the word of the Lord. What a familiar story, right? We all know about it. It was all because of one thing and one person. Uh, no, I'm not talking about Jonah yet. Can I, can I tell you a little secret? Don't tell anyone else. But a few years ago, a few years ago, I had, a, I had an accident with my new Jeep. My wife and I bought this new Jeep in our season of life, going, hey, let's have fun, let's get something different, and let's enjoy life. So we were in this, uh, in this wonderful car, and I'm having a good time. My once shiny and dent-free vehicle was now hurting. <laughs> I thought the way was clear to change lanes, and, and I did that quickly, and in an instant, <laughs> everything changed. That one mistake had an immediate and continuing rippling effect. No one was hurt, but we were all affected. That one thing I did had an impact on two cars, five people, insurance companies, my premiums, <laughs> and my reputation. <laughs> what is going on? Just, I just thought uh, one thing. Friends, I want you to see right up front that our actions, our decisions, often have a rippling effect, don't they? I want us to see in the light of this passage that the rippling effects of sin, or simply put, denying the word of the Lord, those effects, they take effect immediately, both inwardly and outwardly. But also, hear me, so does the grace of God in Christ. And I think we have a beautiful picture here, but you're all, many of you are very familiar with this, but let me remind you that Jonah, Jonah was a prophet, a man trained and called by God to do simply this, bring my word to whomever I tell you to bring it. You are called, Jonah, to bring my truth to whoever I call you to. That's what you are for. And in this case, as you know, Jonah was called, take my word to the city of Nineveh. And as soon as Jonah heard that, 
he refused. Not only refused, he ran away. But you see at the end in verse 17, he's found by God, isn't he? In the belly of a fish. But that's another story. This autobiography of Jonah, I think I want you to see is a precious and honest picture of of a follower of Jehovah who struggles, and yet how God still provides. And in this particular portion that that we read, we're going to see more closely that the ripple effects of sin are real and, and how it affects our hearts as well as our circumstances. You know, when I do talk about that rippling effect, if you're like me, I I picture right away that time where I stood by that that calm pond or lake. Have you ever done that, where you've just seen this mirror kind of smooth, there's nothing, it's a beautiful, just play. And aren't you tempted? I've done it as a kid and even as an adult. (laughs) Pick up that rock and just, I want to throw it out there and see when it hits that perfectly still lake, what happens? I want to watch and see how long those ripples occur and whether they will reach back to the shoreline. That idea that that rock makes a connection that causes ripples to continue on. Friends, sin always has a point of contact, doesn't it? And in Jonah's case, as well as our own, It begins, the point of contact, it begins when we refuse to obey the word of the Lord. When does sin start? When you drop that stone and say, no, thank you. (laughs) I can't do that. It starts to ripple. That's what we're seeing here. It has an immediate and rippling effect. To understand this, To understand, particularly in light of Jonah, we have to understand the context of what was happening in this story. I hope you felt as well as saw and heard those words. The context, very simply put, is panic. (laughs) I hope you sensed that. It wasn't just a cute little canoe ride on a lake. There was severe panic from the beginning to the end of what was going on here. Panic had taken over the ship because an incredibly violent storm was threatening the lives of everyone on board. And you can almost feel their panic as you read verses 7 through 10 where these these mariners, these sailors, they're panicked. We've got to figure out what to do. We've thrown over the cargo and still things are out of control. The men are desperately trying to figure out what was going on And why? And understand further here, because of the bizarre nature of this particular storm, did you sense that, that the sailors believed this was so bizarre, this has to be some form of punishment from the gods. The deities are upset with us. This is so strange and unnerving. Surely there's a god out there who is upset. And we must appeal to the deities of some kind to calm this down. These were seasoned sailors who had been through many a storm, but nothing like this. And they concluded somebody was at fault. (laughs) This is not just a a thing of nature. There's, There's somebody behind this that's causing the gods to be upset. You know, isn't that interesting how you and I are prone to that in some ways, this idea of casting blame on someone else to help appease our consciences? Isn't that, let's be honest, that happens sometimes to some of you? If I can blame you, then I don't have to do any serious self-examination, do I? I'm always intrigued by this, by John Calvin, that great uh, theologian, wrote a commentary on Jonah, and in this very section... He highlights this idea of the shifting of blame. And again, this was written in the 16th century. Listen to how relevant (laughs) this is. What does John Calvin say? Quote, And it is an evil that prevails at this day in the world that everyone is disposed to cast the blame on others and all would have themselves be innocent before God. That's called blame shifting, 
It's really not my fault. Can I explain to you why it's more your fault than my fault? That's part of our flesh, brothers and sisters. We are prone to not have that light shine on my soul. Uh, I don't want to go. That's too dark. Let's talk about where it's your problem and why it's your. So the sailors, they, you saw that they believed someone was guilty. And look how they tried to work that out. Isn't it interesting? The superstitions, the, the, the spiritual traditions and weirdness that go around, they did it by saying, let's cast lots. These deities who are, who are, who are somehow great and control all things, surely we'll find out our destiny by just casting lots. Let's flip a coin. Let's find out who did this. And you see what... What God records through Jonah in verse 7. In verse 7, very simple phrase. And the lot fell on Jonah. These non-believers of Jehovah were still being controlled by Jehovah. Who said, throw your lot out there. That's fine. Watch what I do. I know what I'm doing. So you use your superstitions, but watch what I'm going to do. I'm putting the blame on the one who is the cause of this, Jonah. Again, this was an intense time of life and death. Please, I want you to feel and see the waves were engulfing the boat. They needed a quick fix or face a quick death. It's like watching, I used to watch that show called The Deadliest Catch on Discovery Channel. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it's... It's bizarre and scary. I mean, these guys are in crazy storms, and some of them die, and it's just a frightening thing to see. So I want you to see these sailors weren't sitting around the boat having a cup of coffee saying, what are we going to do? No, if it was a made-for-TV film, you would see these billowing waves coming up, crashing, and they're screaming with their voices to be heard. We're going to (laughs) die. We're going to die. We've got to do something. To paraphrase these sailors who now saw it was Jonah's fault, they come screaming to him, who exactly are you? And what kind of God do you serve, Jonah, to cause this? And Jonah's response was exposing the rippling effect of his sin. You remember what he said here? He explained, my God, let me tell you who my God, my God is the one who made the sea. And the dry land. And that God, Jonah was saying, I'm running away from that God. (laughs) That's who I am. That's who my God is. And this is what I'm doing. I'm running away from him. I want to examine here in our time together two highlights. I want to examine the rippling effects of sin, both inwardly and and outwardly. What does that do to you and me personally as well as externally? Let's look quickly in terms of the rippling effects of sin inwardly. You know, disobedience, which is what I said, which is what that rippling effect is, denying God's word. Disobedience has immediate and potentially long-term effects, doesn't it? Spiritually, you can't just be neutral. Here's just three things I want to highlight. I hope we we see as a result the inward effects of sin for Jonah that are applicable to all of us. First, it immediately, immediately affects our fellowship with the Lord, does it not? It's hard to have communion with somebody you're not listening to anymore, isn't it? The first thing Jonah was affected by in his sin was his communion with the Lord. Look closely at what Jonah was saying several times, I think by God's sovereign oversight of writing this, that phrase comes up several times. Jonah says, this is who I am, and this is what I'm doing. I'm fleeing what? The presence of the Lord. I want to get away from God. He was running not from the concept or the teachings or the idea of God. I am running from the very presence of God. He knew he could never deny the reality of God, but he hoped, he hoped beyond all hope, he could deny his presence. Where can I flee from your presence? 
I, I got to get away <laughs> because if I stop and realize what I'm doing, no, I've got to just run. I don't have time to think about it. I've got to run. That's what every one of us, brothers and sisters, every one of us has in common when we take that first step away from the Lord and his calling. Whether it's that little sin, that little white lie, or that blatant rebellion, it starts with wanting somehow to shake off God from our lives. So the first thing that's affected inwardly is your fellowship with the Lord. Second, it ripples out, I think, to the very thought process. The way we think about God. We begin questioning God's rationale, don't we? And if you're familiar with the story of Jonah, chapter 4. Do you remember where God finally brought him back and he gave uh, this message to the people and Jonah was just bemoaning this whole thing? Why? Because Jonah in his mind could not fathom. It made absolutely no sense that God would have mercy on a people like Nineveh. And if you understand these people, you would have a little bit more of an affinity with Jonah. They were evil, destructive, even to the people of God. They were evil people who didn't deserve this. They should have been condemned and wiped out. And why are you asking me, God, to bring good news, your mercy, to a people who hate you and hate your people? A wretched, dangerous, persecuting, heathen nation. Jason, Jonah reasoned, he reasoned, he could not, and he would not obey God's call in this situation. God, this, I'm not just trying to be some punk, rebellious kid, but God, you understand what you're asking me to do. It makes no sense. This rationale affects us, does it not? The essence of sin is that in this context, it puts your, you, you put your, yourself, your mind on, on a par with God. We think we ultimately know what's best for our lives. And, and we'll consider his commands, but there might be times when he'll be asking the impossible. <laughs> I cannot and I will not forgive that person. I cannot and I will not confess my sin at this time. Sometimes God is being unreasonable in calling me to do some things. He'll just have to understand. Do you ever feel that way? I can't do this. Even though I know it's right, I can't do it. That unbiblical thinking is all over the Bible, isn't it? Starting in the garden of even with our first parents. Did God really say that? Let me think about it and determine whether I should respond to that. So that's the second effect. But the third and final way of this inward effect, it ripples inwardly in what I'm calling a hardening of the heart, brothers and sisters. In other words, you become hard of hearing. Have you ever done that or had that experience? I can't quite hear what you just said. <laughs> I'm becoming hard of hearing. You begin to make your spiritual heart increasingly hard and insensitive to his voice. You know, it's kind of like that child view as parents or have been parents, you've seen or you've watched parents, where that child who's running across the yard or something, and, and that child gets in the habit of going tone deaf when their parents reach out to them. You ever seen that? Billy, Sally, and they act like, I can't hear you. <laughs> you know they hear you, and they keep going. That might be cute at first, friends, but if... But if it persists in life, it can be destructive to be hard of hearing. <laughs> I need give no further editorial comment on this issue than that which comes from God's word itself. It's Hebrews chapter 3. This is one of the more unsettling passages for me because 
He's talking to believers. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says to you and me who profess Jesus Christ. He says this, Take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Brothers and sisters, that ought to do something to your soul that you could possibly not be hearing as well as you should. But oh, this rippling effect doesn't just stop inwardly. As I said, it, it moves outwardly as well. And we see that pictured so clearly and powerfully here. The outward effects are sadly exemplified in, in Jonah's life as well. First thing we see impacted is the very people he's with. No one is unaffected, are they? They might have thought he was a nice guy, but now they wondered who he really was. He was obviously not thinking about the impact his sin might have on those around him. But it is. And again, you don't need a, a lot of pastoral application here, do you? Hear me now. Your sin, my sin, is never, never without horizontal impact. Whether you think it is or not, it is never a neutral, private thing. It always affects those around us. Look at the relational pain in many of our homes today. And in addition, look at what is being said on the, on the social media, on the internet. Brothers and sisters, my sin will affect people. Shame on us that we don't represent Christ better in some of those arenas. Another outward effect that we see here is not just that horizontal, it's circumstantial, isn't it? Jonah's refusal to obey the word of the law, Lord clearly was the direct cause of this storm, wasn't it? Why are we in this mess right now? Why are our lives being racked over and threatened? Jonah's saying, it's my fault. <laughs> I denied what God was clearly calling me to. So part of the reason that this is going on is because of me. They already lost their material blessings when they threw the cargo overboard, but now their lives were threatened. And on top of all of that, they had to find a way. Look at these guys. They had to find a way to appease his God, to try to step in and do what Jonah should have done. Isn't that almost humorous but sad? Jonah, you refuse to do what you're supposed to do. We're trying to help you out, so we're going to row harder. But it's still not working, Jonah. We're killing ourselves here, but it's still not working. They tried to help him be spiritual. Did you see that? Verses 11 through 13. They rode. They, they did their best. And then they finally called out to God. They even tried to bear his burden by working harder, but to no avail. Oh, and I must pause here as a pastor to say to you, my brothers, especially men, Men, how many of our wives and children are, being, are bearing spiritual and circumstantial burdens as a result of our lack of love and leadership? Again, brothers, our wives and children, they don't need a giant. They just need a man who is humbly trying to follow and honor Jesus. But that's for another sermon, amen? <laughs> that's a soapbox I'd love to get on sometime. One side benefit, I hope you saw here, isn't it incredible? One side benefit of this story. These sailors, these non-Jehovah followers, these men tasted the fear of the Lord. Did you see that? And they obeyed the prophet. <laughs> Jonah, what does your God want us to do? What is his word to us? Throw me overboard. <laughs> this is God's call to you right now. 
The word of God through me is saying to you, here's what your obedience should be. Throw me overboard. <laughs> I'm just amazed that they did what God told them to do through this prophet. And the sea immediately went calm. And look again, brothers and sisters, at verse 16. Did you, did you feel what they're feeling? These men feared the Lord exceedingly. And then what did they do? They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Can you have an impact on the non-believing world? <laughs> look at that. In an instant, in an immediate moment of time, these men saying, I don't know who your God is, but he is God. <laughs> And not only that, we are making personal vows. If you are true God, we want to know you. We vow. We will. Honor. Gosh, I want to be around people like that <laughs> who fear the Lord so much that they make daily vows to know him. See the power of that. Oh, brothers and sisters, those of us who sin, all of us, we all share this in common with Jonah. But I want you to see that that rippling effect of Jonah and for you and me has gone even further. The rippling effect of our sin, your sin, my sin, the rippling effect of our sin drove Jesus to the cross. The Son of God came to die because of the inward and outward consequences of our sin. As we conclude, I want to, uh, to help us appreciate further the love of Jesus and what he did for us by looking in comparison at the great King David. That great king, wasn't he? The, the king that had all been waiting for. Who the scriptures describe what? He was a man who? Who was after God's own heart. What? Wouldn't you love to have that reputation? That, that man or woman, that person is, they have a heart after God. Who wouldn't want that? But you know the story of David, do you not? That great man of God committed all these inward and outward sins before man and God. How could that be? His adultery and his murder. It was exposed by the storm from the prophet Nathan who said, you are the man, you are the hypocrite, you are the one. His lust, his pride, his deception was exposed. And if you know David's writing, Psalm 51 is one of the richest and powerful pictures of confession and repentance that you will ever understand. And you have to feel that psalm as well as read it. Because it came at a cost, did it not? Listen again from that psalm, the cry of David's broken heart when he saw his sin. He says this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Oh, hear that. Do you hear what David was saying? In essence, he was begging, begging God with tears and brokenness. God, take anything away from me as a punishment for, for my sin. You are right to condemn me. Take my possessions. Take my health. Take my family, God, take anything away, but I beg you. Did you hear what he said? I beg you, don't take what away from me? Your spirit. Oh, God, don't take your presence from me. I can't imagine living without the presence of my God. I would give up my family. I would give up the most precious things. But I can't imagine life without you, and I deserve it. But please don't take that away from me. What did Jesus cry out on that cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? Your sin. My sin caused the Son of God, 
who always listened to, always obeyed the word of his father. It caused him to be rejected by his father, something he had never, ever experienced beyond comprehension. God the Father took his perfect son and took his presence for some mysterious way away from him. But we dare not leave it there, brothers and sisters. You who have trusted, you who have trusted in that one who died on the cross. Here is a rippling effect of the cross. You who have trusted in Jesus alone. Here is God's word to you and me. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, even when you sin, because Jesus paid it all. The incarnation, the death and resurrection of Jesus was the point of contact when God entered history. Jesus literally dropped into the storm of life and brought restoration and salvation. The blame of sin and its rippling effects was laid on him. Forgiveness, unconditional love are just some of the eternal rippling effects of the grace of God in Christ. My brothers and sisters, go live in that promise. Don't stop listening to and obeying his call. And don't stop remembering his promises. And may Jesus Christ be praised. Amen. Let's pray together. Our good and gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, God, that you do not leave us to ourselves. For we are desperate and broken, but because of Jesus, we have all the hope in the world to fight against sin, knowing that he has paid that final price. God, make us followers of Jesus who trust in him alone and who walk humbly, even in our brokenness, with assurance of that eternal love. Oh God, have your way even this day in our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen.